So after 9-11, we go to this small country in the Middle East with an immense amount of wealth through their oil called Iraq. And you can see Iraq in the bottom right-hand corner in the on the world map. This red nation that was controlled by Saddam Hussein. And we can kind of look at the United States invades. You can see in the picture on the left, kind of there's a very different fighting after 9-11 Afghanistan. And we're going to talk about where in Iraq, most people live in cities because most of it is desert. So there's going to be more street fighting in the cities as opposed to Afghanistan, where the terrain is more mountainous and uh, spread out and there's more farming. On March of, of uh, 20th of 2003, U.S. declared war on Iraq and invaded Iraq with 148,000 troops. This invasion went very well. In fact, we moved quicker than we thought we could. Within 30 days, we had basically taken over the entire country. And Saddam Hussein was on the run and in hiding. The war had been called the Second Gulf War, Operation Iraqi Freedom. So we had been at war with Iraq earlier in the 90s uh, as a result of Iraq and Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait, which is a tiny little oil and wealthy nation to the southeast of Iraq. And when they invaded Kuwait, it was agreed upon, even the UN and NATO had basically accepted the fact that this was breaking United Nations law. Countries cannot invade other countries, and America led the way and pushed the Iraqi army out of Kuwait back into Iraq. And Saddam Hussein was kind of cut off and received sanctions and lost a lot of his power. However, he was still in power. So under George President Bush Sr., that war was stopped before the United States actually went back into actually invading Iraq. They just pushed back their troops into Iraq and stopped there. Well, under President George Bush Jr., George W. Bush, the one that started uh, the war and led the war in Afghanistan and had to re react to 9-11, he still had this power given to him from Congress that while he didn't have to declare war, he could send troops into Iraq and actually attack them. And he used it. This war was much more protested and there was more conflict and controversy over it. So we're going to look at what kind of the fighting looks like in the war. And uh, here's the scene from Bangladesh. So you can see uh, that is a very famous iconic scene where the U.S. military came into basically the center of Baghdad, the capital of Iraq, and tore down probably the biggest statue of Saddam Hussein in, in this huge square. And you can see that just the excitement from many Iraqi men that they're happy that Saddam Hussein was gone. And this is symbolic. Saddam Hussein had committed several humanitarian crimes against his people. He gassed his own people. He imprisoned his own people. And I've even talked to people that were in jail, put in jail by Saddam Hussein in Iraq. So he was a pretty vicious dictator. 
who tried to establish totalitarianism, total control over the country of Iraq. So there were a lot of groups that were welcoming the United States taking over Iraq, and it started off very positive. It moved quickly, and we were welcome. Here are our objectives. The U.S. objectives in Iraq were to, according to the uh, United States government, eliminate or destroy the weapons of mass destruction and stop make, the, stop the making of, of nuclear bombs that Iraq was believed to have. Topple or cause Saddam Hussein's regime to fall. A regime means a system of rule. And Saddam Hussein had been in power for many years. And make Iraq a democracy. Those were our objectives. And there was some discussion by the U.S. government that somehow Iraq was connected with Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and had maybe worked out uh, and some it was implied by the U.S. government that somehow they that this had something to do with the attack on 9/11. I really wanted to come because I'm in a lot of upperclassmen classes, and so many people I know have already enlisted and are on waiting lists to go over. And I just really don't want any more of my friends to leave, and other people's friends and children to leave. Uh, I'm from the uh, Tidewater area of Virginia, which is uh, very heavily militaristic. There are a lot of military bases in that area, and uh, a, a lot of my friends have uh, come up. Uh, we've we brought a couple buses up from uh, Norfolk and Newport News, and we're, we're we're here to make a statement. It's clear that what we're doing over there is not working, and I don't think it's uh, responsible of us as a country. It's uh, responsible of our elected officials to ask very brave young men and women to sacrifice their lives for a failed policy. We've got to make sure that we do not involve symbolism in our funding of the war. The president does not understand symbolism, so sim symbolic resolutions must be replaced with decisions to cut off the funds. You know, the definition I think it was this, uh, one of the definitions of a fanatic is someone who redoubles his effort when he has forgotten his purpose. That fits the president. I think that we all have a responsibility to stand up to Bush and to the warmongers. Um, this is an immoral war. It's benefited no one except Bush's friends and cronies, and it's got to stop. This is the freedom of speech that people died for in prior wars, and this is what we're here for otherwise. Their blood. What we should be doing is redeploying with an exit strategy, helping to bring the region together, supporting whatever the Iraqis want in way of security and involving all of the region in that security with the United States backing out. And they have to stop disconnecting the war over there from the war that continues to come home when kids come back and they're damaged psychologically when they're grieving, when they're seriously wounded, when they're mentally troubled. So you can see there was there was a much more active anti-war movement against Iraq. Afghanistan, there was definitely more co uh, cohesiveness in America where people felt like we got to do something about 9-11 and we got to trust the president and we're going to let him send troops in. Iraq is much more controversial in America. There was a lot of protesting um, and there was a lot of pushback from the people and there was also pushback from many representatives as well. As you can see, there were some famous celebrities that were speaking out and trying to, to, to be activists. Now, Iraq is very, very complicated. So is Afghanistan. So Afghanistan, we talked about. Afghanistan had been invaded by everybody from the, Mon the, the, uh, the Mongols and until the Hun. And it had never really been conquered. It had always been a complicated land. Iraq, while it's one nation, Saddam Hussein, as ruthless as he was, he used fear to basically consolidate three major different groups that see themselves as almost three different countries. Um, and once he was taken out of power, it did not go very smoothly. So Iraq was made up of three, it's still made up of three different ethnic groups that wanted power over the country. Ethnic means a group of people with a common culture and identity. So the mainstream and the largest group that supported uh Saddam Hussein, not completely, but almost all his Ba'ath party 
That was the name of his party. It was Saddam Hussein's bath party. They were almost all Sunni, Sunni Muslim. In the south, you had the Shia, and you can see the Shia are kind of like that brownish color. The Sunni are in the center, and, and the most populated city at Bang, Bangladesh is mostly Sunni, and that's where Saddam Hussein lived. To the very north, you had an ethnic group called the Kurds, and the Kurdish were a majority in the north. Now, almost all the oil is towards the, the bottom and the south, where the Shia are, and the north where the Kurds are. Bang the middle is not as much oil. There's still oil, but not as much wealth. So the majority was using the wealth from the minority groups' areas to run the country and dominate them, the Sunni. And we're not going to go into all the details, but basically the biggest difference between the Sunni and the Shia is uh, not much difference in terms of uh, what they argue over. It's kind of similar in my mind a little bit to between Catholics and Protestants. They're all Muslim, just like Catholics and Protestants are all Christian. But they argue over who is the uh, who's next in line as as the basically the spiritual leader of Islam after the Prophet Muhammad died. So was it Ali, his his uh, son-in-law, and so forth and so on. So that's one distinction. Shia tend to have much more of a hierarchy. They have more of an organized structure, like the Catholic Church, where the uh, Sunni tend to be much more open and anybody can pray and lead and they tend to be much more like protestants like protestants have individual religions and their churches are led by their ministers or preachers so those are some similarities most muslims are by far sunni shia are a minority but you know, i've had students that are sunni and shia in america and it's not really a conflict here it's not really a conflict in a lot of parts of the world but in the middle east in iraq iran Saudi Arabia, there's definitely some conflict in these areas where these groups don't look on each, look at each other as the same, almost like different races or different groups of people that cannot be dealt with. So you stay and live within your communities. So once Saddam Hussein left, it just turned into a powder keg where these groups are fighting each other and trying to push the Americans out. And in the first election, the Sunni refused to vote, and as a consequence, the Shia and the Kurds had more power in the government, and that's they quickly learned about democracy and started changing that to make the Sunnis the most powerful block of voting today. So this is what it looks like at nighttime. The soldiers are going street to street. first got here, everyone was glad. They all thanked us. It was good America, good America. A lot's changed since then. People speak their mind a little more freely. They're not so good all the time. Some people don't like us and they'll tell us now, and some people attack us now. Yes. Yes. So you can kind of see that this is like house to house combat. The American soldiers are going into their houses. They're kicking in doors. They're trying to find weapons and explosives. Uh, they're dealing with IUDs, which are these basically these created explosives that would blow up the Humvees or there's these road traps and they kind of try to attack the Americans in these crossfire uh, surprise attacks. And that's that's what's really causing a lot of the problems. The guy says, when we first got here, good American, good America. They're very happy. We got rid of Saddam Hussein. Um, but in the end, now they're they're mad at us, right? They're very upset with us. And now they see us as, a, as not good anymore. Well, for years and years of this going on, 
and people and you got the americans you see them kicking in your neighbor's doors it starts to cause a lot of resentment and like why are you guys still here and we feel this responsibility we have to rebuild the country but at the same time they want us out of there because uh, they see it as their country so you again you can see the sunni kurds are at the in the north and kurds are uh sunni religion but they see themselves as a totally different ethnic group uh, it's one of the one of the ethnic groups that doesn't have its own state or government. There's no Kurd Kurd country, so the they're found mostly around northern Iraq and Turkey. They've been persecuted. There's a lot of Kurds have come to America to be uh, free and treated more equal and have their rights. This you can see the Sunni Arabs and the Kurds where the they start to mix, and then the Shia are in the south, and they have Basra, which is uh, where the big ports are. And that's where all the oil has to go out. So that's a more wealthy area too. So you got the Kurds in the north still today. The Sunni Muslims are mostly in the middle of the sun in the country. It's mostly desert, not the uh, best environment. There's some waterways with the Tigris and Euphrates River. That used to be the Fertile Crescent, an amazing fertile land until human beings overfarmed and destroyed a lot of it. Now it's desert. And the Shia are the, they'll be called Shiites or Shia. Muslims in the south and you can see the country's really three different countries almost and we were scared once we leave this whole thing's gonna powder cake it's gonna blow up and they're gonna all fight each other and have a civil war well we're gonna find out suiciders we were wrong uh, to kill innocent life uh, who would uh, this is President Bush explain what happened we imagine did that. what the world would be like with him in power. The idea is to try to help change the Middle East. Now look, I did, part of the reason we went into Iraq uh, was, uh, the main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't, but he had the capacity to make weapons of mass destruction. But I also talked about the human suffering in Iraq. And I also talked the need to advance a freedom agenda. And so my question, my answer to your question is, is that Imagine a world in which Saddam Hussein was there, stirring up even more trouble in a part of the world that uh, had so much resentment and so much hatred that, three, that, that people came and killed 3,000 of our citizens. You know, I, I've heard this theory about, you know, everything was just fine until we arrived and, you know, kind of the, the, you know, stir up the hornet's nest theory. It just, it just doesn't hold water as far as I'm concerned. The terrorists attacked us and killed 3,000 of our citizens before we started the freedom agenda in the Middle East. They were... What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing. Except for it's part of... And nobody's ever suggested in this administration that Saddam Hussein ordered the attack. Iraq was a... Uh, Iraq... The, the, the lesson of September 11th is take threats before they fully materialize, Ken. Nobody's ever suggested that the attacks of September the 11th uh, were ordered by Iraq. I have suggested, however, that resentment and uh, the lack of hope uh, create the breeding grounds for terrorists who are willing to use suiciders to kill to achieve an objective. I have made that case. And w one way to defeat that, uh, you know, the, the, the defeat resentment is with hope. And the best way to do hope is through a form of government. Now, I said going. So you can see President Bush is really on the hot spot because this war quickly turns uh, ugly. It did not go the way that it was supposed to. While, yes, we moved quickly through and we, we were winning uh, the war, the, biggest, the bigger problem was, in fact, that um, there were no weapons of mass destruction. We found Saddam Hussein something like 20 or 30 miles out of Baghdad. He was hidden in like a, a underground cellar. He was tried. He was executed. It was an embarrassment to the United States. The international community was appalled. We'll, we'll, we might look at video and talk about that later. His trial. He had a trial. Most of his lawyers were murdered or killed trying to represent him. They were bombed or murdered. And then at the end of it, basically they said he was guilty and they walked him outside Walked to the inside of a tower, threw a rope over his neck, and lynched him, and uh, hung him, uh, and recorded the whole thing on cell phones. So the world saw this this type of justice, and that was seen as very unjust to just throw somebody up and kill him. 
uh, not to say he wasn't guilty, it was just that the trial itself was kind of uh, very disorganized and a lot of people died to even pull this off. Now some other effects were over 5,000 American soldiers have died in Iraq, 32,000 were came back wounded, mass suicides, and many have committed suicide, taken their own lives. After dealing with living there, you can see the man was missing his legs. A lot of American veterans have come back with uh, disabilities and harm. Finally, President Obama, who was elected 2008, and one of the reasons he, he or one of the claims he made when he became president, he was going to end the war in Iraq, and he did. In 2010, he pulled the troops out of Iraq, um, and in fact, he said the war is over, we're done, <clears throat> which in many ways it wasn't. Many of these groups continued to fight. Uh, things have really calmed down now, but it's been quite a few years. And the other thing is that ISIS would come into Western Iraq. And again, we'd have to consider putting back American troops into this to stabilize Iraq because we're scared Iraq might fall to ISIS. So other effects you guys saw. And we talked about also you have 50,000 troops were... Uh, fighting to the end and they were fighting insurgents and then the insurgent was a rebel or person that fought against those powers and you can see that the soldiers are are putting american flags on the graves and uh the positive uh, effects might be that uh, iraq is still a democracy it does have a, a representative government and uh it is still intact unlike afghanistan which has fallen